Welcome to Cheers to Fears, where we take horror films and turn them into drinking games. We are your two hosts. I'm Tucker. And I'm Alex. Today we will be making a drinking game for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, directed by Toby Hooper. Toby Hooper is mainly known for his work in the series, but one more notable thing that he directed was the movie Poltergeist. Hooper was also the writer for the movie, along with Kim Henkel, who was also involved with a few of the other installments in the series. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is about a group of friends and a pair of siblings that go to visit the grandfather's grave. As they start to run low on gas, they hear a nearby generator to see if they can borrow any from the nearby people. However, they are unaware that inside of the house resides a family of sadistic murderers. Again, we have reached the point in the video where we are going to be moving into spoiler territory. So, if you have not yet watched the movie, we would recommend to pause the video now and watch the movie alongside our drinking rules that will be posted on screen now. If spoilers are not an issue for you, or if you have already seen the movie, let's take an in-depth look on what the rules are. The first rule we have for each drinking game is death. If you see somebody die, you take a drink. For being one of the earliest, if not the earliest, slasher movies ever made, it did not have a super bloody kill count, as we only were able to spot five people in this movie that died. The next rule is that if you hear somebody scream, cry, or yell, you take a sip. During this movie, we witnessed a total of 17 screams, cries, or yells. Sorry! It is also worth mentioning that if somebody is consistently doing any of these, we only mark it as one, as this movie is a clear indication on why we always set up the rules like this, but we will get into that later. On to the third rule, which is you're supposed to take a sip when you see a chainsaw. We felt that this was fitting since it's in the title of the movie after all. This rule ended up giving us an extra 8 drinks to our total count. The next rule that gave us 10 drinks was you take a sip when you see bones on screen. For this rule, we did not include individual bones, as this would get mercy ruled in almost every scene you saw with bones. So when you see a collection of bones, that's still just one drink. The rule that gave us the most drinks by far was when you see somebody enter or exit a vehicle, you take a drink. This individual rule gave us 22 drinks. Moving on, we have a rule that if you see Franklin struggling to do, or is unable to do something because he is in a wheelchair, you must take a drink. As for this rule, Franklin ended up giving us 8 more drinks that we had to enjoy. For this next rule, you are required to take a drink when you see a meat hook. As there are only four in this movie, we are not hurting too much from this rule. If you are on the highways of Texas, you tend to see at least a little bit of roadkill on the side of the road, which is related to our next rule. If you happen to see an animal corpse, you drink. We saw dead animals 11 times in the film. This does not mean bones, however. It can either only be dead or stuffed animals. A rule that is similar to us drinking for when we hear a scream, cry, or yell is this next rule, which is when we hear the Sawyer family laughing. These rules are alike because we drink for scream, cries, and yells because it represents fear. The Sawyer's laughter represents joy for them. This rule ended up giving us nine drinks. <laughs> Last of all, you need to take a drink when somebody walks into the Sawyer house. I don't know why so many people were willing to walk into a house that they had zero knowledge about, but regardless, it happened eight times throughout the movie. So we had to tally that and add this to our grand total. And that is all of the drinking rules that we have for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. The total number of drinks for this movie by our count comes to 102 sips, which is the equivalent of drinking just under three and a half standard 12 ounce cans. And that number of course is based off of 30 sip per can scale. This is one of the more surprising drinking games that we have made, considering the rules gave us just over 100 drinks, which isn't that much. So yeah, as you mentioned really well paced, uh, it started to get quite a bit more difficult during the dinner scene, which I think is basically in almost every Texas Chainsaw movie. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, however, during that point it was just a non-stop scream, cry, yell, laugh from hillbillies, or uh, you even saw like more bones, more animal carcasses. There was a lot to think about during that scene. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And considering the fact that there was a lot of screaming in this movie, the fact that we only had 17 in the end, because it's basically just one long scream, Yeah. it's kind of surprising. But uh, yeah, that's kind of up to interpretation as well. If you want to choose to drink more often and you might decide that they stopped screaming where we didn't, mm -hmm. it's kind of up to interpretation. So just be leery about that rule. Yeah. 
right up until Sally becomes the final girl, it's just her screaming for I think 35 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> Uh, with that being said, once Franklin dies, just her consistently screaming. Uh, Leatherface is chasing her throughout the forest, wherever, finally finds refuge, still like screaming, crying inside of there, gets knocked out, wakes up again, continues screaming. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole movie. So a few weeks ago, I know how we talked about how the thing aged really well, and in my opinion, I don't think this aged really well. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's something we actually disagree on for once. Mm -hmm. um, I think this did age relatively well. Granted, there is a lot of screaming that happens, but mm -hmm. I think just because it's such a classic and it kind of helped pioneer the slasher film in a way, this is, it's kind of rides the fence of being a slasher film. Like it's mm -hmm. different than yeah. your typical gore fest that a slasher film brings, mm -hmm. but it kind of helped pioneer it in a way. Oh, it definitely did, yeah. So I do think this aged pretty well. Even going back and rewatching it, it's it's one of, it's not my favorite horror movie, but it's up there for sure. Mm -hmm. And I think I might be a little bit biased because this is actually the first horror movie that I ever watched as yeah. a kid. So it, it kind of introduced me to the horror genre as well. So I, I could be biased for that, but I, I don't know. I think it did age pretty well still, but I, I could understand the, perspective of why you think it didn't. Yeah, I guess the main thing that kind of does it for me is just the consistent, obnoxious people in the movie. Yeah, that's That's fair. one thing. Uh, honestly, there was a lot of great shots in the movie, the cinematography as well. Oh yeah. But other than that, like, just a lot of things did not age so well. Like, people just randomly walking into houses, being stupid. Well, yeah. And just the hillbilly screaming all the time, like, my eardrums were kind of bleeding in the last <laughs> 20 minutes of the movie or whatever. I guess that's a fair point about how the characters are obnoxious and, like, they make a bunch of stupid decisions. Mm -hmm. But I think at this point in time, that's just become a cliche and that might be, looking back in hindsight, like, that's part of what helped form the cliche of mm -hmm. making stupid decisions in horror movies, so I can get that outlook, yeah. looking in the eyes from a modern day perspective. I guess some of the characters that I didn't like, obviously there was Sally screaming at the, the end, I won't get into that too much, I talked about it already. Mm -hmm. uh, there was Franklin in the wheelchair, uh, he was just kind of a brat. <laughs> Franklin, it's gonna be a fun trip. <laughs> he, he looked like a 25 year old, probably playing an 18 year old in a five year old's body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the hitchhikers were kind of annoying. Uh, the chef, obviously, and Leatherface were good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, even though Leatherface obviously didn't talk, he killed, which is why people watch the movie. So oh, that, yeah, that I liked. I guess one more point about the hitchhiker to make otherwise, kind of off topic, is that the hitchhiker in, I think, Texas, he actually made crimes kind of go down 18%, just from crimes that happened through hitchhiking, like picking up, getting murdered. So he actually was congratulated by the Texas, I think, chief of police or something like that. That's pretty awesome that yeah. that actually happened. I, I didn't know that until you found that out, but it's kind of funny <laughs> to hear about. So you, you did bring up about how some of the other characters are kind of annoying, but you mentioned how the chef and Leatherface are really good characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of their intentions as they were directing the film, because they obviously want you to be more invested in Leatherface and like his actions and stuff. Like mm -hmm. he's the main focal point of the film. And in my opinion, as it is with many other slasher films, you don't get invested in the characters as much. They're kind of just there to be killed, in a sense. Um, granted, this does it a little bit different than more uh, slashers that come down the road, like Friday the 13th, yeah. where they literally just throw people in there for the sake of being murdered. Yeah. They try to set up these characters a little bit, at least. But yeah, I do get to your point about how they're they can come across as annoying, especially Sally for screaming oh, yeah. all the time. <laughs> so as far as this movie goes and slasher movies all together, this one felt kind of tame because it wasn't so much gore involved. Like mm -hmm. the kills weren't gory, you didn't get to really see them that much. Um, there was a lot of dark subject matter, obviously, we just didn't get to see it. Um, and I think because this whole concept of cannibalism, which there are other movies that talk about cannibalism that mm -hmm. go a little bit dark with it but this one just the atmosphere and like you mentioned cinematography and everything 
the way that it, they make you feel so unsettled and creeped out the whole time, yeah. I think they do such a good job with that, and it kind of doesn't need the gore, in my opinion, because mm -hmm. it makes you feel so unsettled and disturbed through the whole movie because of the subject matter that they're oh, talking yeah. about. And even with the kill with like the, the meat hook where she basically gets hung up on the meat hook, mm -hmm. Even that, you don't see her actually get hung on there, but you can just imagine what that would be like, and exactly. it's just like, it makes you cringe so hard mm -hmm. and stuff. So I feel like that's a really effective way that they made you feel like this, and whereas some of the other slasher films, like, like Friday the 13th, they go for the goriest and the most insane out there kills, mm -hmm. where this one tries to make you feel disturbed and unsettled by not showing you, but rather making you feel that certain way, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, no, a lot of the gore was definitely, like, kind of null and void. It was just left up to true interpretation, mm -hmm. which I think which Toby Hooper was relatively going for. Yeah. As, obviously, if a lot of things are left up to true interpretation, it could be like, oh, maybe this didn't happen or something like that, which is kind of what he was aiming for in the sense that he wanted to make the movie PG. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, that completely backfired, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> considering the movie almost had an X rating. Yeah, well, um, Yeah, I guess just all the way that things were implied definitely didn't help. You can see that he did it a lot better in Poltergeist, mm -hmm. but I feel like that could be a lot of like the writing, such as um, Steven Spielberg having more of an influence on that. Right. Yeah. And that Poltergeist isn't so much about uh, straight up murder and stuff. <laughs> Cannibalism, <so> yeah. <laughs> it's not as dark of subject matter. It's mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, even, even children's stories, there's ghost stories about mm -hmm. for children. So like they could get away with more, I think in that sense. Mm -hmm. And I guess, short point, it's kind of based around the serial killer Ed Yeen, how he made people into furniture. And honestly, this guy had it right. Uh, have you looked at Price of a Key recently? <laughs> I haven't. It's not great, but I'm pretty sure human bodies only get you a life sentence if you're caught. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's why Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like, you, they often say it's based on a true story, and that's why they can say that, because it's it's based off of Ed Gein. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very poor true story. I oh, mean, well, yeah, The course. truth is really stretched from the, the main concept. It's kind of like The Conjuring, how they say it's based on a true story. Yeah, and but, Ed and Lorraine are heroes, exactly. Yeah, so it's a stretch, but that's why they can say that. <laughs> so we brought up cinematography and how it was really well done. Um, just overall set design, I think, was really well done. But some specific scenes that are just so iconic is the one where Leatherface is kind of just dancing around, spinning around with the chainsaw above his head in the sunrise. And just a side note about that, it's hard to know if it's sunrise or sunset mm -hmm. because we have no idea how long uh, Sally was in there being tortured and whatever and mm -hmm. like it's very disorienting in that way but you did research for it and you found out it actually was sunrise which is news to me but yeah. Anyways, like just how the movie kind of ends with Sally driving away in the truck and stuff, and it's it's just a very iconic scene. And yeah. that's another scene that is in our intro that we have on, on our channel. Yeah, I guess another thing to add about that, it was probably a decision to make it either sunrise or sunset, it didn't matter, but it's the fact that you wanted to do one of those two because they wanted the audience to feel just as she felt, like disoriented, didn't yeah. know if it was either or. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like a little bit of a peek into her sanity at that point. So yeah. I, I definitely loved the fact that they did that and just not like night or day. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, and I think it helps with the overall look of the shot too. Oh, just yeah. Just because it makes it look so much better than yeah, if it was just, just red, like full sure. daylight or yeah. whatever. Yeah, it definitely helps with that. I guess the other few scenes to mention is Pam getting dragged into the house of, and the steel door. Like just her just flailing as Leatherface just so effortlessly picks her up. And just uh, the common slamming of that steel door. Oh yeah. Still sends shivers through my spine. Yeah. But um, the other one is just, I guess, the whole shot of the Sawyer house. Like the Sawyer house looks fantastic. Oh yeah. <laughs> like just the bird feathers, the chaos everywhere, the animal pelts, it just looks so messy and disgusting it's great oh yeah it's definitely believable that a bunch of psychotic hillbillies live there and mm -hmm. like they do a good job setting that up i guess we talked about how uncomfortable the movie is and that was exactly the point as you mentioned before you you kind of think of like how somebody could do this and it's the exact same reason why people are so obsessed with like serial killers and crime documentaries yeah. on netflix or whatever yeah exactly so after all that being said what are your overall thoughts on this film so it was good uh but again it aged poorly it's not that the movie was old, it's just that I wasn't expecting it to be 
not as gruesome, yet alone it to be just kind of so hectic and chaotic. Yeah, that's fair. Um, which leads into a lot of the characters just kind of being annoying in a sense to me. Yeah, 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 that's fair. I guess my point of view is I don't pay as much attention to the characters in this movie. I've seen it so many times at this point, so I kind of knew that there wasn't a lot of gore involved with it. Yeah. So I kind of went in with the with that expectation because I just know how unsettling and disturbed it made me feel, especially the first time watching it. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's kind of why I think it didn't age poorly, just because of how iconic some of the scenes are and just like how good it looked and how effective it was at making you feel mm -hmm. disturbed and uncomfortable, yeah. which I believe was the point that they're going for with this movie. And so I guess we just look at different things in this movie and take away different things. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's one of the first and very few times where we haven't really agreed mm -hmm. on the overall thought of the movie, but yeah. And finally, we come to the award ceremony, where we award one not-so-lucky nominee, the Darwin Award. This award goes to a character who made a stupid decision that resulted in them getting killed, somebody else getting killed, or simply resulted in something bad happening that could have been easily avoided. This award can also go to a character that is just plain dumb. Here are the nominees. Today's first nominee is Sally, who as we mentioned before likes to scream, like, a lot. Sally decided to scream for the last 30 minutes of the movie. One example on how this could have gotten her killed is that she was being chased by somebody that not only has a lot of weight to him, but is also wielding a heavy chainsaw that can weigh as much as 20 pounds. While being chased by this person that is probably not that fast, she decides to yell the entire time in the middle of the night to give him a good lock on her location, just in case she manages to outrun him. Our next nominee is the truck driver. He was only in one scene in the movie, but he saw Leatherface and ran as fast as he could. And by that, we mean he ran as far away from any safe place he could have went. He ran away from the truck that could have driven him out of the situation, or the other truck that picked up Sally. Speaking of the truck driver, we have the person that he killed up next, the hitchhiker. He could have easily sidestepped the truck instead of putting up his hands and bracing for impact. He had a solid three seconds to attempt to jump out of the way, but I'm pretty certain that quick thinking has never been one of his strong suits. Hitchhiker. Should we pick him up? Oh yeah, man. Pick him up, he'll asphyxiate out there. What does he look like? The last person, or people we should say, that should get a nomination today are the collective group of friends. We know it's kind of weird to nominate a whole group of people, but hear us out. Not only did they pick up some crazy hitchhiker that looked like he would hurt them, but only kicked him out after they started harming one of their friends. Also, a majority of them just kind of walked into the Sawyer house and got themselves killed. And the winner is... The Hitchhiker. To be fair, any one of these people probably could have won, but we felt that there is no way that he didn't have the time to move out of the way of the truck. I just wanted to add that the truck driver was probably a very close second. He just kind of left the movie. Yeah. <laughs> He just ran down that road and didn't stop. Yeah, odds are he ran into another house full of psycho killers. <laughs> um, another person, obviously, Sally. I could have saw her winning just because of her screaming the whole time. And just a fun fact, Gunnar Hansen, the guy who played Leatherface, ran faster than Marilyn Burns, who played Sally, despite having the risers on his feet and like carrying the chainsaw <laughs> and having all that heavy stuff on him. He still ran faster than Marilyn Burns, so... Stealth would have been a better option for her rather than trying to run away and scream. Oh yeah, especially just considering how dark it was outside. And she could have just hid somewhere more than like. So Sally would always know where Leatherface is, but Leatherface would never know where Sally is. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And with all that being said, we hope you enjoyed the drinking game for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. If you end up playing the game alongside the movie, or if you have any feedback or suggestions, let us know in the comments below. Also let us know in the comments if you think the film aged well or not. Make sure to like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the next week's episode where we are going to be making a drinking game for another slasher movie. This one will be a little bit more modern though, as we are making a drinking game for your next. If you want to check out our most recent video, click on the box on the top right. If you want to see a playlist of all the drinking games and movies we review, click on the box below it. Thanks for tuning in, and this is us saying cheers, cheers to, to fears. fears.